Well, okay, bye-bye. Okay, welcome back. Okay. Okay, everybody. So let's see, who's here right now? If you're here, raise your hand. Who's not here? Doesn't work, does it? Okay, oh, you're not here? Oh my God, you're a hologram. Okay, all right, that's, uh, you gotta expect that. It's the modern time. Okay. You guys ready? Okay, you guys ready? Hola. What do I say, silencio? What's a, what's a commanding term? Shut up! No, I can't say that. <laughs> I said it in a bad Spanish accent. <laughs> Shut up. What? Cállate. I actually know that. There's a, li there's a woman on TikTok that says, Cállate. Cállate. Does that mean uh, shut up? Oh, great. Good. You're teaching me all the mean ones. Hey, Cállate. <laughs> um, excuse me, uh, would you mind cállate a little bit? I'd appreciate a little cállate. What? Ore. What's that? Oh, is that a curse? Oh, God. You're going to get me fired. Not that it matters, but okay. No, no. You could come up here and say it. What does it mean? No, I don't trust you. <laughs> okay, guys, we're going to get started. At least pretend to be interested. It's important. Social, social norms. Pretend. Shush your neighbors. Shame is good. I come from the United States, it's a Puritan-based culture. Okay, guys, okay, think like it's church or whatever relevant to you. Okay, guys, we're gonna start, okay. Callate, <laughs> is that the word? <laughs> okay. So, now it's time for our second round table. Uh, returning as host will be Lee, uh, and the topic will be, and I'm looking forward to this one, ready? Outrageous travel tips and predictions. I think this is going to be good. Uh, so please, uh, Kayate, and welcome to the stage, Lee. <laughs> Thank you. Let's hold them to shut up enough. They're ready for you. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for kayating everybody, so we can get on with the uh, get on with the show. Um, so yeah, no need to introduce myself. You've seen me before. So I'm going to get on and introduce the panel. Um, who are going to be talking about their outrageous travel trends predictions. That we, this, that we've, we're raising the ante now. This is the most outrageous panel ever at a travel convention. So first up, we've got Fritz Oberhammer, who's the Chief Product Officer, Supplier Solutions at HRS. Welcome, Fritz. <laughs> Take the further seat and we'll fill in from there. Uh, next, we've got Baz Lemons, who's the President of EMEA Hotel Planner. Baz. Welcome, Baz. Uh, then we've got Elodie Lunen. She's deputy CEO of, and co-founder of Fast Pay Hotels. Welcome, Elodie. And last but not least, Mario Gavira, who's the VP of growth for Kiwi.com. Yeah. <laughs> right, so... Actually, we did, we, did, we did prepare for this, didn't we? So I've got some predictions. That's why I've got this. Their predictions are on my screen. I didn't have a chance to print them out. So I just remind me what they were talking about. We've got a few we've pre-predicted, and now we're going to discuss it. So I'm going to go to whoever predicted their prediction. They're going to tell you what the prediction is, and then the other guys can wade in and tell them if they're crazy or maybe they're not being outrageous enough. We should, you know... Um, okay, let's stop. There was actually there was a couple interesting ones around... Super apps. We'll go with Mario. Mario, you have got a prediction about Google Maps. Google go. Maps. Go. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. So Google Maps, everybody obviously has it on his phone. It's by far the most downloaded app in the travel category in the Western world. And uh, it's not a navigation map anymore. I'm sure you guys already use it you know, to search for restaurants, to for search for sightseeing places. So they actually, in very typical Google style, have been, these last 10 years, adding features to, to the navigation map to make it actually much more stickier and much more engaging, um, which uh, means that now, 
I don't know how many of you guys still use a travel guide when you go to a destination, but probably you use Google Maps already to, to actually get around when you come to a, to a new place. Now, the interesting piece is that obviously you all know that Google has the biggest meta search business in hotels already, that that is nicely embedded into Google Maps. But the fun part is when these guys are starting to integrate the digital wallet. Uh, the super apps in Asia, as you probably all know, they, they are very powerful. Why? Because they have the pay payment details of uh, all of the customers in the app, and basically they use it for ordering food, for buying stuff. So basically it's, it's their kind of Swiss knife tool in, on the mobile. Now, once Google starts to get into micromobility and starts to actually allow you to use the Google map to pay your bus, your uh, electric scooter, whatever you want, then basically you're starting to actually use it in a much more frequent way, not only to search, but actually to run transactions. Uh, and then what's the next step? They basically get also the hotel piece into the mix. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that um, 10 years, 15 years, who knows, but uh, we will see Google Maps become maybe the super app in the Western world. Uh, and that is means for hoteliers that they will have to definitely make sure that they are really well integrated in the whole Google ecosystem. And, and specifically, you missed out, you said 50% of hotel bookings in the Western world. In the Western. It, by 2040, yes, we'll be on Google Maps, right? Outrageous, yes, <laughs> 50 percent. That's my bet. Great. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so actually, super apps is interesting because clearly massive in China, not really taken off in the West. Ella, do you think? Let's let's start with the super. Is there going to be a Western super app, or yeah. are we different? culturally, and we don't need one. Yeah, so the, yeah, there's this, this big debate about the fact that in Asia, you know, because people use mobile, like, you know, part of their arms literally to book everything, travel or any type of product, you can name it. And then it came to the US and it, it was like, yeah, in the US there's some potential in there and what's going to happen in Western Europe, right? Because we all have very different cultural approach to this. But definitely the super apps are great potential and opportunity for sales and in travel also, there's definitely something to do there. I actually think that in travel in maybe 20 years, it won't be about the travel product anymore. It will be a combination of different and different products. And mainly, I think the main driver of this is because of the data. Uh, data insight is super important. We, we can't do anything right now without data. And data is not going to come only about travel, right? It's going to come about your income, your family, who you are, how, how do you operate on the internet, right? So it has to get a mix, and I, I think the super apps are well positioned to get into this mix and try to define you as a guest or a customer in travel to get the right product to you. Yeah. yeah. But, but is it, isn't this, let, let's be critical, for, for a minute. <laughs> no. Isn't, isn't this just the old, oh, watch out for Google, they're the big boys, they're going to take over. Yeah, but the that, funny thing... How, how, that's, that, we've heard this for 20 years, it's not happened. Yeah, I, I don't know. But uh, the, the fun thing is, you know, we talk about travel companies today, but Google, of course, owns everything. If you know that they, we spent 22 billion on advertising with Google, plus now they're going into travel, but also don't, uh, ch uh, we have some other super apps, like Uber, uh, Amazon, because I think we have to go one step further to be real outrageous, because I think we all still are very old-fashioned 25 years with uh, our apps and our websites. Uh, this morning I was listening, you know. We still have a search box. Come on, guys. <laughs> My daughter talks to her phone, so we need to speak. So the apps who can handle speech and, I, and a free search with speech, they will win. Yes, Google is a front runner, but we also have Alexa, for instance, with Amazon. So I, I believe, because I'm just, I was curious if you look at, yes, we need one app, because I see how lazy my kids are, and they are 21, 20, and it's 13. They, they just want to have the information right away up front. You know, I was asking the question this morning about 38 websites they're looking for. They don't do that anymore. They will just, push into an app, I want to go to Barcelona, I need to know in a nice restaurant where you guys are saying, this hotel, this flight, give it to me. 
And if I don't get it right away, you're out of this. So I think, and we are very slow in the travel industry, you know, we are really, you know, what, what really changed the last 22 years, guys? <laughs> we had a search box, we had TripAdvisor, nice, and we had some uh, comparison websites, and then stops. And we still type in, I want to go to Mallorca. <laughs> Come on, guys, no. You have to know I'm going to Mallorca. I want to have the best offer. So I think, yes, the apps are there, and on the back end, I also never care, because it is just, you know, just deal with it, you know? Why does the Amazon app work very well? Why does my, we have an HollandBull.com uh, works very well? And, and I only see it on behavior of my people. I, in my car, I just talk to my car. So I always say, you know, look at it. On the other industries, like clothing and other industries, where things are moving, and we are moving pretty slow in the travel industry. So that's one I want to give you away. Please be a little bit more, get that done. Because what I'm really looking at is also at the fintech companies. They are moving into our travel yeah. sphere. They're calling me, I need your supplies. What, your fintech company, your payment system? No, we have 20 million users. And those users are there. Yeah, yeah. sorry. So if you ever see, ever see Baz shouting at his car, it's not because he's gone mad. He's that <laughs> exactly. And then my daughter likes it, you know, up, down, windows up, up, down, window up. <laughs> so if you take your, take your daughter to hockey with five kids, it's not good. Oh, that's so annoying. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. They love it. Frit, Frit um, are, are, are we too obsessed with what Google's going to do? Uh, as Baz has suggested, Amazon, Amazon, maybe someone we've not even heard of yet. Because Apple. Super, super apps have come from all sorts of places. And in, in India, it's payments. They've become a travel company. Uh, WeChat was a, I think it was a messaging app, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, um, a payment service. Um, well, spending, I've spent eight years at Expedia, and I was, was wondering what impact that Google finally have, and I spent a lot of time talking to the Google travel guys about this, and I think there's one thing we're forgetting, that's the human element, because Google owns as much as the aggregation, your search, and your book, and then what are you going to do? What the traveler is going to do? What if something goes wrong afterwards? Google will not help you. They refer the traveler to the hotel, so like you, you figure this out with the hotel. And I think this is the reason why Google has been not, not become so dominant, and maybe a reason why booking and Expedia still exist. Somebody needs to be an uh, advocate for the traveler in front of the hotel if something goes wrong, because things do go wrong in travel. Or there is some kind of special request that need to be facilitated, or Somebody needs to stand up to the hotel so like, no, don't charge that traveler that money. And Google doesn't do that. So for me, it was always the point like, okay, transactionally, that's great. But this is also why they never, I think, will have their own product. Because you know what? It takes a lot of effort and a lot of staff to run those programs and to be an advocate to the hotel. Okay. Let's move on. I want to try and get through as many as possible in the amount of time we've got. Uh, Elodie, let's move to one of yours about travel pricing. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, yes. So I I I have this uh, outrageous travel trend. Uh, thinking about how pri uh, pricing travel is going to evolve in the next two decades, right? And I think uh, it's a bit like what we were talking before. And I think the digital DNA uh, will be uh, mostly the most important factor when when pricing will be driving. And and and. Definitely, for the past 20 years, we've seen a lot of pricing according to customer segments. I think there was some mentioning before about, you know, the hotels, for example, are putting so much effort in, in getting the right segment of customers. And uh, we all know there's a distribution that's different according to your nationality or what the type of market, what your, what's your buying intention. But I think, you know, as, as we go and, and we gather all this data and, and we get organized, I think the digital DNA that you have will drive those prices. You know, you, according to all this data around you, what, what is your habits as a yeah. consumer? So this is so, yeah. the ultimate in variable pricing. Uh, yes. It's not really a price for anything, it's just what you're prepared to pay for it at that moment in time. Yeah, and it will be very much personalized. You know, yeah. we, we were talking also before about personalization. Now, I think, you know, those chunks of pricing that we see that uh, for me are totally obsolete nowadays, right? So we, we can't drive the customers by if they're B2C, B2B, if they're leisure and business. We've, so all the lines are being blurred right now. And I think that, yes, I think uh, pricing will have to get to the next level and maybe a lot more personalized. So another way of saying I disagree. It's, the, it's the end of meta search entirely because you can't. Yeah. No, but I disagree. Uh, prices that don't exist. <laughs> no, the thing is, uh, look at other industries. Look at Apple. The MacBook 
the iPhone, everything costs the same for everybody. And that actually creates simplicity, kind of clear feeling of not of trustworthiness, while as we in our industry have been yielding like crazy. Uh, hotels, airlines, you name it. And everybody feels they have been kind of ripped off, right? So uh, the more you go into this personalization pri of pricing, the more you're creating confusion, the more you're creating lack of trust. So I actually would give us an outrageous prediction that there are going to be a reverse of what we are <laughs> moving towards, and actually there will be a much more kind of standardized pricing for uh, at least for the same services, right? When you compare apples to apples, right? Okay, oh, yeah, I think it's so. fair, it's totally fair. But I think yeah, as we go into amenities and very specialized, I mean, we, we see distribution in terms of hotels and chains investing a lot of money in how they can personalize experience. So I think that will have to come with price. But I agree with you, today it's very much confusing and we're not doing it the right way. I think probably other industries will go there before us and uh, We'll have to see how that goes. Fritz, mm, 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 no. got on. No, I, I think um, what I see, and that that's probably a business trouble point of view, is we're going to move way more into attribute-based pricing. And I see some people like, oh, attribute pricing, here we go again. But think of the following fact that the travel product that's sold today is a monolithic block. It's one rate with the breakfast included, not the negotiated or a different kind of thing. But the world we live in today, if you fly, you pay for your seat, your leg room, I don't know, the toilet maybe soon. You pay for anything. But the hotels don't do this. They don't see their rooms as a piece of, it's a thing with attributes, and those attributes can be sold. So you can sell a room, and the attribute to it is a rape plan with a breakfast included. But it might also be a bottle of craft whiskey in the, in the room as well. Now, from a business traveler point of view, why this is so important is, Today we go out there and negotiate, Siemens comes in and says, like, negotiate 100,000 room nights for us. And that's the budget, and that's what we're going to do. So we, then we go into the year, we have a recession right now, and Siemens says, like, oh, now we have to cut it down to 80,000 room nights. We're like, okay, so we have to cut it down. So in the future, though, we'd say, okay, so there's 100,000 room nights, let's do the following. Let's do 20,000 with an attribute of a breakfast attached, let's do 20,000 with an attribute of a late checkout, 1 to 2 p.m., another 20,000 for late checkout to 4 p.m. So we come back to the same scenario, and Siemens is like, oh, our budget has gone down. It's like, no problem. We'll just cancel out the breakfast attribute from those 20,000 rooms, and we can still hold the rooms for you, for your travelers, stay with your budget. Go back to the hotel and tell them, well, we're sorry, we're going to have to cancel the breakfast for those room nights, this attribute you've added on, but guess what? You're not going to lose the sale the best the travel is still to come. So I think this attribute-based model will be the future of the travel industry. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, the rooms, room types, is a concept of my grandfather, he's a hotelier. Yeah. So we had a standard room, an executive room. What does this even mean? We should have, have attributes of a size, a view. We should have quiet rooms, big rooms, and we should make that sellable, and that should be sellable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there has been moves to try and sell hotel rooms by the number, by the, like on a cruise ship, you can choose your, home, your cabin. I mean, they're all fairly standard yeah. on a cruise ship, but actually in a hotel, they're no, not rich for them. Viking, Viking uh, I, I was last week with Viking Cruises. They, uh, you know what I love about their model, about websites, really? I can do exactly, I go on a cruise, but I can put whatever I want to put in my mini bar, you know, and a swimming pool access. So I think exactly what you're saying. You know, we got, we're going to be Ryanair, very easy. If you don't follow that up, you know, uh, it will be dynamic pricing. Uh, so easy at a Ryanair. They showed us how you can do very good yielding per airplane. And I think the hotels have to follow that model. You know, even KLM and other companies are still lacking behind, but it works. You know, the most profitable uh, airline company is Ryanair. So come on, guys, don't uh, think again. But the hotels are used to kind of revenue model from, uh, you know, I started when I started with booking, I started, you know, 50% discount. It's bullshit, but people believe it. Um, uh, I took out breakfast because I was cheaper than Expedia. So uh, that are all tricks. But eventually, I think, you, you, can, you have to get the same as an airline. And exactly what you're saying, you know, in the States, I get 
berserk about executive room, uh, corporate room, uh, partly sea view. I hate that, you know? You get partly sea view. You have to look at this and that is your sea view. Come on, guys. Make it more transparent. So, yes. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Let's go to Baz this again. Um, so, you're still on Baz. Um, your, one of your predictions is blockchain is finally making travel perfect. Yeah. Well, define perfect. Yeah. Okay, everybody talks about bitcoins, everything. Don't invest, guys. It takes a while. But same as the beginning of the internet. I believe blockchain, well, a little bit was the old GDS, you know, everything is connected. So, I believe that if I am in the chain on what we talked about this morning, also about the flights, the car, um, and uh, hotel booking, and you cancel everything at once, you can do that in a blockchain, because it's a contract with all the parties. And I think that makes it also much easier to, what, what I'm doing all my life, I'm contracting hotels, I'm contracting hotels. But if they are in the blockchain, uh, I can have access to it. So, but also for the consumer, it's very transparent and very easy to change. So I think, yes, we will go that way. Um, it takes a while because also we, together as parties, have to agree about what kind of blockchain it will be and how we're going to put that together, like the GDS did in the past. Uh, so I think, yes, in 20 years it will be. Uh, and especially with the usability on what we discussed this morning, you know, you want to cancel, if I go to Washington, New York, and Seattle, I want to cancel, I have to go three times, click, 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 and then a rental car, there, 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 there. That is not helping. So I think that will be uh, absolutely uh, the coming 20, 20, 30 years happening. What, when, you, when, you, when you say perfect, though, do you mean you'll never have a problem? When yeah, you, I mean, yeah, but you st still, now what we have, we, we sell each other's products, you know, I'm selling uh, Booking.com, Expedia product, I sell my own product, everything goes like this. And, and especially when it goes wrong, they all point at me, I don't know why, but uh, um, uh, so you get to blame as a merchant of record, um, but it is sometimes also for hotels not obvious anymore where the booking comes from. And I think you can, uh, that you can solve with blockchain or exactly where did the booking come from, who, did, who was the merchant, who paid, and also very easy back. We have a lot of fraud. We yeah. kick out the fraud. You know how many credit card frauds uh, still happening is unbelievable high. So that's all these kind of things you take out. Because I know who you are, you know, if you are misusing. I saw that when uh, uh, the Ukraine, uh, the war started, I got like... 20,000 bookings in one week from kind of Russian things. Yeah, they were all fake. And there was like a bombardment of things. But I paid out hotels, I had to get it back, so it cost me 200,000 euros. But I couldn't find who was there anymore. Yeah. Mario, is, is the idea of making travel perfect itself something you should achieve, try and achieve? Because actually, in some ways, it's the imperfections of travel that make it kind of interesting. You don't always want to have to know everything you're going to do and you want to be somewhere and discover something by accident, and no one can really make that happen for you, you just do it. You, go to, you turn left instead of right out the hotel and discover something you wouldn't have found. So is the idea of perfect not really applicable to travel, do you think? Yeah, the definition of perfect might be different for each of us, right, in this yeah. uh, room. So, uh, yeah, perfect is a bold statement, but uh, I guess that's, uh, that's a way to rock the boat. So, yeah. I suppose not, not having any issues or friction, frictionless, being yeah. feeling yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let, let's move on. Um, f let's go to far end, to back over to Fritz. Um, you want to talk about velocity, proximity of customer interaction, explain. So I think, uh, <laughs> I come from a family of hoteliers. So when I grew up as a little boy, I went with my grandfather, put those letters to the post office, and three weeks later, get mailed back, I'll collect the stamps. And it was a slow process and then faxes came and my dad wrote faxes and guests started to decipher what he was writing and we moved on and it we became faster and faster. We, we came into email and, and today my brother owns the hotel and he and his staff communicate via direct messaging, WhatsApp, Google, whatever it is with the, the traveler. But what we can see is a pattern of it's faster and it feels closer for the traveler to interact. So what I see for the future, and now we're going to bring in the matter space, because that's kind of like the holy cow in the room right now, is in the future, as me as a traveler, right now, I don't know how you guys feel, but if you've ever been on the phone with an agent and you wanted to make a booking, you always feel like, oh, I don't know, if this, is this going to happen? It puts on hold. Like, is this, what's this place going to be? So I think in the future, yes, hotels will be in matter, 
and you come in and an agent will talk to you, which is just an AI, catered to your needs, and you say, like, well, me and my wife, we're coming to your hotel, can you show me the room? Which is all, again, based on attribute-based selling, because that room will be fixated in there. It's so like, okay, I'll show you to the room, Mr. Woman, and you go in, and then you can say, can I have a champagne bottle there? Or you'd even suggest it. You can have a champagne bottle right there for another XX, and then you go to the balcony to check the view, and while you're out there, this AI works with you. They measure your your, your emotions, your feelings, when you talk to it, are like, okay, you get excited. It's like, have you had a dinner reservation, Mr. Wormer? So you say, oh, well, no, I haven't had one. So let me take you down the street to some restaurants. You can take a look at the table you want to book. Mm -hmm. Because I think attribute-based selling will go out of the pure hotel industry and be around and connect everything. Because all of those restaurants have now tables which have an attribute of a couple of chairs and a nice view. And you can pre-book all of that. And you're going to walk this through to make sure you know, your wife is happy and the avatar probably is going to meet my granddad or something of the like. So I think this, the meta space is going to help us to overcome one of the biggest problems we have in travel, the anxiety of travelers, because it's not going to be as it is. And I had this conversation today at lunch. The most genius way to kind of play that was from this commercial from Booking.com, which they did during the Euros, where you could see a family opening a door. And that moment, and I'm sure every one of you has that as well, is you come to the front desk, you stand there, and you think, like, for God's sake, I hope he's giving me a nice room this time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we can overcome this fairly easily in an attribute-based selling system where you can preview the room. Now you tell me, oh, well, you know, with hotels, lots of changes on the front desk. Well, I've done it myself, but you can pay a premium to reserve this room. And I don't know how you guys feel, but... I've traveled many times, and then you type in, can I stay in room 520 again? And how often do you stay in that same room? Yeah. But it's such a low-hanging fruit that we should build this technology, preview it, come there, and the experience will be just a much easier one than the current one is like, oh, well, I hope the wife likes the room. And you have kind of picked a nice restaurant on TripAdvisor. I'm not sure how it's going to work out. But you could kind of re review and relive this whole experience. Now, that has to have an element as well of, the virtual experience might be so good when the reality kicks in. How do you keep that in, in, in kind of like in balance? So that's going to be interesting, but we're definitely going to go there, I think. This ties in with a number of, the, of your restrictions as well. Um, LD, you said most travelers will visit a place before actually going there. That's the method. Yes, it's, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's very much based on the attributes and making sure that actually I think customers will get a lot more information be before going to travel. So it's exactly what Fritz is saying, actually. Yes, yes, it definitely does be this experience. And I think travel sales need, need to get there. Yeah, yes. I, I think, isn't it Seoul have said they're going to become the first fully metaverse city in the metaverse? Mm -hmm. and, and, they're, and they're not doing that to say visitors virtually don't come. They're doing it to say visitors virtually and you'll love it so much you'll have to come because yes. they're not saying don't Definitely. come, are they? But that's the fear, isn't it? That yes. this replaces travel, which is probably what Fritz was sort of alluding to. But, but th there is a revenue opportunity there. That's what I said as a, as a kind of uh, prediction that 20% of the revenue of hotels can come out of the metaverse twin uh, the digital copy of the property. And that is, I mean, today we, we know already that in gaming, 40% of the revenue is generated with virtual goods, right? I mean, gaming is huge, right? It's uh, twice as big yeah. as, as cinema. Uh, last week I read that Nike sold a virtual NFT sneaker for $135,000. A bloody virtual thing, right? Now, translate it into travel. If people get used to have a digital avatar and they're going to be traveling offline but also virtually, imagine this. Rolling Stones come to Rio Janeiro. In 20 years, Mick Jagger will be still alive and kicking. That's another prediction, <laughs> but that's, that's another thing. That's an outrageous prediction. They, yeah. they do a concert which is in person and virtual in Copacabana Beach. You can, with your digital avatar, pay for the best suit in the Copacabana Palace to see the concert virtually from your room. That is something that people will be willing to pay, right? If they're willing well, to pay for a sneaker... It's happening, it's happening, it's happening yeah. Abba, 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 Abba playing Abba, Stratford. Yeah, Abba playing Stratford. Abba of avatars are playing Stratford. <laughs> Stratford. <laughs> 
And people yeah. are booking hotels in Stratford to go and see non abba players. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah the, the places were sold like super quickly in a few days, or sold out ABBA concerts only with autographs. Yeah, that you yeah. check the video and you say, well, it's all about the experience, the emotions you get from not being in the same room with ABBA, but getting back this emotion of having a concert with them, which is oh, yeah, yeah, definitely an interesting. It's experience. happening. Yeah. I mean, crypto currency is perhaps a little bit of cooling off right now. So well, value if you invest in Bitcoin, it's like... And the value of your NFTs can go up as well as down. As it's it's as going down, but there's a winter. We know the summer will come back and then, uh, then there, will be, uh, there will be massive money. I mean, that's... Yeah. that's uh, but, from. But, well, I, but the fun thing is, because I completely agree, you know, we're selling already now, okay, uh, we're selling most of the time, sorry to say, in disappointment. Because people, exactly what you're saying, they, like, like American, in the beginning when I started, in 90, whatever, 98, you know, America coming to London and the room is too small, you know, or they let the better small. If you can exactly virtualize that, that they see the expectation, I think the complaints will go really back down. So, um, and I even believe that, <clears throat> especially what you're saying, you know, a lot of stuff you can do before people come to get that experience. Because I believe that the experience is from booking till you end. But if you have to wait on the desk, or when I check out, I have to desk, my whole experience, zip. Same thing if you go to a restaurant. It's really good food. I have to wait 15 minutes on my bill. The food is shit. So, uh, no, th that's the experience. It has to be good from beginning one to beginning end. And that's where Metaverse can really, really help. The, the, the link with gaming is interesting. I mean, yeah. you've got uh, pop stars like uh, Ariana Grande doing concerts in Fortnite. 40 million people. Yeah. So, you know, you think, well, why is she doing that? Well, of course... It, when she does her world tour, 10% buy a ticket, she sold, she sold out. You know? The Mona Lisa is a good example. So you're creating digital yeah. audiences and then turning them into online, offline. Or you're going the opposite way, isn't it? You're going into, from online to offline, oh. which is quite powerful, very powerful. It is. But, but even very easy, you know, try to take your kids to a museum. You know, if you have, you're sitting here in Mallorca with 30 degrees, you know, say, come, let's go see the museum. But if you can do that uh, digital, okay, you have, they give you some cultures, and then you go to the beach again. So I think it's all good for us in the future. Yeah. And mon mon money's pouring in. I mean, uh, I just read that Gucci has good in Roblox, right? Roblox is yeah. supposed to be the gaming yeah, yeah. virtual yeah. platform from kids, right? Hmm. Fucking Gucci, <laughs> which is like probably not what your kids you would expect your kids They're to not be interested Gucci in. Handbags, are they? You know? They they had 20 million visits to their virtual uh, Gucci garden in, in Roblox, which yeah. is like why the heck would so there, there there is something in there. I mean, people are companies are investing into it, and hotels as such, if you think about it. I mean, it's all about the experience, right? So if it's physical or virtual, as long as it's immersive, yeah. it's, it's, it's a perfect target for, for, for the metaverse. Yeah, and I think it's going to be very interesting how to see how the new generation is coming out of this because I mean, my, my daughter is nine years old and she's taking Roblox lessons nowadays. She's very used to being in this environment, totally fake. Um, and she has created her own world, right? And... Uh, she invites friends to come to this world and it feels so natural for her. And uh, when I'm sitting next to her, I'm like, well, I wasn't doing that, definitely. Um, you know, about this metaverse and how, how we approach it, how we see with, you know, with our eyes, but in their eyes, it's a totally different story. Yeah. It's better than sit 27 hours on uh, TikTok, <laughs> what my daughter is doing. You know, TikTok, 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 all day. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my kids are more Minecraft than Roblox. Oh, Minecraft. And I remember a few years back, uh, they discovered someone had built a, a cruise ship in Minecraft. It had millions of views. And actually, I, thought, I remember this and thought, I'll Google trying to find it. There's now loads of cruise ships on Minecraft because obviously it became a thing. So if you Google my cruise ships in Minecraft, and you just think, to get a younger generation into cruising, it's so powerful for one of the brands to go, well, it's a virtual version of our, our cruise ship. When, you wanna, when you're ready to come on a cruise, choose this one. You know, that's oh. incredible, the power of getting <coughs> the kids involved early and saying, pest the power upwards to the parents. You know, can we go on that cruise? Right, yeah. um, okay, let's, let's move on. Right, let's go back to Mario. Uh, this is your third one, about airline capacity. Do you remember yeah. That? yeah, I mean, that, that one's less funky than Metaverse, it, right? Yeah. It's, it's, a bit, so. it's a bit, <laughs> a little bit dry. It's a bit right? this one. Yeah, well. yeah, but I, I would still throw it out here. I mean... We, most of you probably know that the airline industry, um, even pre-COVID, the legacy carriers, their short haul network was loss making. They were, except for a few business routes, they were losing money big time. The only reason why they kept it was because they had to feed their hubs, 
for the long-haul routes where they make money. COVID hit, bang, everything obviously went, uh, went bust. Now, uh, what happened in the meantime is that obviously low-cost carriers who have a much, much, much lower cost structure, cost structure as we know and are much more agile, they basically have uh, been operating profitably before and are starting to become profitably again uh, after COVID in especially the short haul, obviously long haul, short haul, medium haul, intra-European uh, region, right? So what does this mean? If already pre-COVID in certain markets, low cost had roughly 50% of the capacity, what we see now, if you look at AOG numbers, is that uh, actually the only carriers that are growing in the short haul, medium haul, in Europe at least, are Ryanair, Wizard, and then you have a little bit of EasyJet and so on. While as the other carriers are still massively down. So overall, I would predict that here, from here to five years, basically, the, the whole airline capacity in Europe will be clearly dominated for intra-European traffic by low cost, 80%, I would expect. Add to this the order list of the Ryanair's and Wizards. I mean, what they have already in the pipeline of new planes coming in for the next five years is basically doubling their capacity. And uh, let's face it, Lufthansa, Air France, all these carriers, they are doomed. They were loss-making before, and now that there's even less corporate travelers, uh, especially for short-haul trips, it's even worse, right? So um, that has some implications. That means that people who actually want to travel long-haul will have some more painful experiences because they, except if you live in Paris, London, uh, Madrid, you might have some problems to actually get to the, to the hub to, to take your long-haul flight, which, uh, which, implies, uh, yeah, which implies certain, certain frictions and pain points for the travelers. Obviously, technology is there to help. Here comes my Kiwi speech, <laughs> Kiwi virtual interlining. You probably all know this. We believe that this is the future and that this is going to be even more important because precisely the interlining, the traditional regional legacy carriers will stop cooperating among them. So you basically will need a technology layer on top of, which basically do the whole frictionless connection between low cost, uh, fast, speed, fast um, speed train, and the long haul route for flying out of the Paris or London hub. So that's, um, yeah. Yeah, that's that, that is happening, I think, recently. It is. But Berlin Airport just did a virtual interline with a, a competitor of yours. Yeah, correct. With, with, with rail, so that it correct. turns that airport into a, a much bigger hub for the region. Yeah, and th what might happen is that certain carriers might even, legacy carriers might do partnerships with low-cost carriers. Yeah. The thing is, knowing at least the two big ones, or the two most ultra-low-cost ones, which are Wizard and uh, Ryanair, they do not probably play with these uh, other guys, so they might just uh, say fuck off. So which, yeah. which, is good, which is good, because that means that we have a technology that will have to be there to, to basically allow the customer to find the right connections. Yeah. Fritz, you're not from the airline background, but what do you think, what, how do you see the, the airline well, I can playing out? If I see it from a business travel background, I see an interesting problem that also came again to me when I saw Wouter's presentation today. That's the whole CO2 issue that we have for business travel. Now, all the European nations have signed the Paris 2030 Accord to you know, get emissions down. And for big corporations, I think in the future, they need to control the CO2 spend per travel. Otherwise, we'll penalized by banks not getting any loans or any money. That's coming. I've, heard, I've had some talks about this. I've heard there's some groups, financial institutions getting together and so they, those business travel companies, or there's those business those companies, they need to be carbon neutral or otherwise pay, or if they go over certain limits all the time, financing for them will become harder because they're not green enough. You might call it greenwashing, but this is where we go. So avoiding flights is going to be a topic. I personally think within 10 years or even less, we'll see a lot of those Flix buses, but full automated with, with electric um, uh, engines going through Europe, where you get in in the, in, the, in the evening, you sleep overnight, the whole thing gets you to your place, and you can order it on the fly, bus comes, picks you up, because there's going to be always a route of electric buses coming around. So short-time travel is also going to be going more into this self-driving kind of environment, because companies will have to think about 
how do we offset the CO2 footprint of our long distance flights, which are super massive, but those companies need to make sure they keep somehow a balance. So they can do all kinds of things, but that's something where they have to take into consideration. Flying for business purpose will hurt you financially in the future because your carbon footprint as a company will create problems. But, I mean, we could be you know, super, I don't know it's outrageous, but um, you know, um, visionary here and say Hyperloop's going to... I, I think and, so. And, and short haul flying forever. But, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you will get two things. Hyperloops, because the watch movie uh, from Elon Musk is uh, really good to see the future. Uh, Hyperloops will work. They do it now in Holland. They will start in the States with Branson and uh, Musk. But also now we have the electric, I call it, uh, not the helicopter, drones. They will also come and yeah. they will all be uh, electric driven. So I think that will be the big movement. And yes, I agree. If the airline, uh, airline industry doesn't watch out exactly, uh, uh, People, uh, people will not take the flight. Um, but I still think, you know, the, the, if I get to the Switzerland, you know, that I love that train system. If I'm in Holland, it's a very small country, they always delay. But the second bad thing is, the government wants us to get the footprint down on CO2. Why do I pay more for a train ticket for one hour from one place to another place than I even pay for a ticket of EasyJet? Or... Uh, I can put petrol in my car. I have an electric car, but still. Um, uh, so I think those, those things have to move. And I don't understand. In Luxembourg, I think I did. They, or now Germany. You can travel by train the whole month for 950 in the summer. These kind of initiatives I support. Because then people will go into the train, and exactly what you're saying, and will not fly. And anymore. the connectivity between those parts. When I live in the middle of Austria, and I dream about, you know, in Dubai right now, you can rent a self-flying helicopter. Yeah. So what's the difference for me having this thing up in the mountains so I can go to Cologne? It's just the size of the drone. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a sizing problem and something of a battery problem. But well, we're going to solve this. I think when you, people which now have moved out to the countryside, and I'm one of them, I've moved from Madrid up to the countryside, they're going to stay there eventually saying, you know what, if I need to go somewhere, I order this uh, drone, it's going to come to my house, I jump in and I fly off. And then it, it's an interconnected system. It can drop me off at another point, or I jump on the bus, or I jump on the train, but it's going to be way more interconnected than it is right now. Yeah. An LED, I suppose if we were doing something like this 10 years ago, and we said com countries will ban the combustion engine in cars in, by 2030, we'd have gone, mm. that's outrageous, never going to happen. And then a guy called Musk comes along, exactly. literally no. by one person with a vision. Yep. I mean, let's face it, that's what's happened there, and yep. it's changed everything. So yeah. it shows how things can move quickly. You have to make cool things. You need cool things, you know? <laughs> yeah. We, we were as in Prius, sorry. But it was so ugly. Nobody wants to step in, only the Californian people. Yeah. You have to make something cool, you know? Start also with the rich on boats. Make really fantastic electric boats. And everybody will move. So that, that's the only trick. You have to make something nice, you know? People like <laughs> nice things. Oh, uh, yeah. And you, you need to make it available also because, um, yeah, there was this, this is, there's clearly this is intention to go into sustainability, but how do you go there if it costs you a lot more than what your income can afford? Or how is it the infrastructure? So you take the example of Mallorca, which is a, is a, is a nice island where we should all be able to go with electric cars everywhere because we're not that dependent on, you know, a, a long battery or whatsoever. But when you do realize that you need to plug your electric cars somewhere here, it's it's getting difficult because yeah. they're not ready yet and you, you still need to... You do have some parkings where you can plug your electric car, but you will have to wait 12 hours maybe to, to you know, to, to make it work again. So... Definitely, you need to make it available also to to people willing to do, to do this next step to to be able to do it. Look at the e-bike right now. You know, it's so, so popular in Holland. Everybody's e-bike. It's dangerous for all people driving 50 with a uh, bike, so that's dangerous. But still, everybody's e-bike. And the next generation, they I I cannot buy an, uh, a, a car on gas anymore. My daughter will not allow it. I tell them that I'm in the travel industry, so you know how many CO2 I put in there. But still. They, they want this, so I think it's the next generation, they will push, they will push, push, push to get this done. Yeah, there's, there's, there's always difficulties in implementing these things. I mean, yeah. in, in London, you know, the streets are littered with bikes, people just leave everywhere. Yeah. And, it's and no doubt they are the new shopping trolley, because they'll be in canals and all sorts, and yeah. be digging them out for years, but, you know, it, 
they live in this kind of perfect world where things work and people, and people behave well, but often people don't behave that well. Let's, let, let's move on. We've got nine minutes left. Um, back to, uh, we'll so stick with tech. Back to Baz. Yep. 3D, print, 3D printing of clothes. In, uh, yeah, of clothes. That's what, that's something different than. Uh, what I also think, you know, you guys are all traveling and I hate, I not like to travel light. Because I don't, you know, uh, skip all at the airports, I lose my bag, and, uh, you know, not enough people, so I travel light. But still, sometimes I have this pr trouble, you know, I go to uh, London, it rains, so I need a raincoat. So, you can buy one, or you can print one. And I believe that 3D printing, Federal Mind is a big 3D printing company, and it goes really quick now, uh, that I believe in 20 years' time, you know, if you need something, you print it out in your hotel room. And then if you don't need it anymore, it goes back, and then you can make for somebody else his uh, code. So I believe uh, in the future also, people will have less things, but you can make it on the spot. And that's what I think will take a big leap. Because I also see now, um, I don't want to own anything anymore anymore. You know, look at my, if I go to my girlfriend and look her, at her cupboard, it's unbelievable. <laughs> you know, how many shoes can you have? How many dresses can you have? And she wears it only once. <laughs> so come on. And then you go, uh, and then you go to New York, you have a gala, and she forgets her dress. Okay, let's buy one. No, <laughs> uh, I believe you can print uh, the dress and then hop. Uh, put it back, because you need the sizes. Why? Because people think it's a ridiculous idea, but no, because the biggest problem is sizing. You know, everybody looks different, but yeah, you make a body scan from yourself, plug it in, dress, go to the gala, and back, and it can be reused. So I believe in that one. And I think it's good, because that's also even the next generation, that people... Uh, Still, sneakers are a little bit, sh with the youth, they all want to have sneakers, so that's not happening yet. But even Nike does it. You go to New York and I want to have a Nike shoes, they make it directly on the spot. So I think that will be a big, big, big thing in the coming 20 years. Well, I think, Mary, does, does Baz just want to reduce the spending of his girlfriend, or is he is the opposite? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's basically it. But actually, with that, I was just thinking, if you go through this path down, the fast fashion industry is dead. So that's good for us because that means that money will, there will be more money left for actually spending and travel, hopefully, right? So, yeah. And I don't have to shop anymore. Oh, oh I would love it. <laughs> Not to shop with my, with my girlfriend anymore in New York. Ooh. There's definitely been a move away from owning things, I think. People's houses now are not full of stuff. Like, yeah. you know, I think about antiques. My mum used to collect antiques. Who, who invests in antiques just to stick on a... A window cylinder. That's if my mom dies, you know, I'm busy for five weeks uh, getting all this stuff out. Said, all for you. <laughs> no, it's ugly. <laughs> um, Elodie, let's go to one of yours about China. This might raise some eyebrows. Okay. China, do you remember? Uh, yes. Become the biggest destination. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I was saying that China might be one of the biggest destinations for health. <laughs> but just very outrageous right, right yeah. now. But... Well, um, but yes, no. I was uh, I was reading the other day about uh, what what China is into in terms of uh, advancing DNA technology and 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 how they now have able to read your your your, your genes and, and DNAs and how those machines now can can read them very quickly and a, a lot cheaper way than we do it today and and uh, so it's called CRISP um, uh, DNA processing and then you, um, you you definitely know how to they're, they're talking about treating uh, cancer and then China started in 2016 on this um, it it raises a lot of questions ethical questions of course mm. but I, I I think in travel you know when you when we're traveling for health and we saw it during COVID right people would travel to get the vaccine where they want they wanted to have it and and, and there's a, a big industry traveling maybe to get uh, an operation. Uh, but when, normally when you travel, the operation will take maybe uh, three weeks. You have to stay on site and, you know, um, and then go back. Um, I think that in the future, well, yes, if China is capable of, of dealing with your DNA and it's a three-day operation just to read your code and, and maybe change us until your physical aspect that they're clearly talking about, Changing physical that's very outrageous, but I, did, I wanted to put it out there because yeah. I think it's very... China's obviously got its current issues around health that are preventing this go there. They have to get over that, don't they? <laughs> um, but, but, but actually, travel, travel for wellness and, wellness and health, Fritz, is a, is a growing category. You can see that being... Uh, 
relatively, or is it? Do you think it's still going to be niche? It's going to niche, I think, for me. I mean, for the, the China angle for me is I spent some time with our guys who built their own product team just for China, and they introduced me in the way how they WeChat and WePay and works and how that velocity on the market is just insane. How they interact with their apps and that they go directly into the app. There's like I was like, oh, we need to do this and that. Apps like no. Fritz, you don't understand. It's, it's WeChat, that's it. You put everything in there. And I think a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing right now is super interesting is the consumers expect like the goods that they usually order through WeChat to be incorporated into other things. So I think in China very soon it's going to be a common thing that the traveler books via WeChat, via voice, actually a book via voice now. They go to the hotel and the fridge is full with their favorite drinks ordered automatically through their favorite delivery service. And that's going there right now. So I think that level of personalization, China is absolutely trailblazing on a level that we haven't even grasped. They've jumped the whole search box that you've said it. They're really, just really like voice in wine app and have everything incorporated into your trip. So yeah. definitely it's going to be there. But from health, mm, before we just sure. wind things up, when I was thinking about this session, I was thinking, Im imagine we were doing the session at the first Connex in 2019, and one of you said. There's going to be a global pandemic, and, and travel will close down for two years, but we'll, but we'll survive somehow. Um, and we'd have gone, that's the most outrageous prediction, ridiculous. So it just shows how this is not a very scientific exercise, and none of us are going to predict anything quite as disastrous as that. But a question for you know, want all of you to sort of, do you think we're sitting here now where it's, we, don't want, we obviously don't want to predict bad things for the industry, but, but clearly our imaginations about what could happen often get taken over by reality and we just can't believe what might happen in the future. It's very, so this, doing this process is very difficult. Because yeah, yeah. I mean, the, who said that? Somebody in Silicon Valley said that we, we, they promised us flying cars and we got 140 character tweets, right? <laughs> Which is like, yeah. so far, I mean, hopefully the flying cars will come, but so far, I mean, uh, I guess the only thing we know is that we are wrong. Yeah. That everything we predicted was, is wrong, but uh, in some form or shape, some of this stuff, some underlying trends, will uh, crystallize in something which, which uh, yeah, we don't have the crystal ball, so uh, we will have to live it. And uh, again, hopefully not in such a dramatic way than uh, in, you know, a COVID outbreak or something like I, this. I think the thing with technology often said is that people overestimate what it can do in the short term and underestimate what it can do in the, in the longer term. Right. And that's yeah. often what we are, isn't it, LED? Yeah, and I think there's nothing, there's nothing wrong at being wrong, right? And, and as long as you're creative and you're thinking and everything you read is valid and everything, you know, as long as you think about things and, and, and try to project you in the future, I think everything is valid. There's, there's no wrong answers into uh, how do you define the, the travel trends. And uh, I think the important thing is that you, you definitely think about it and, and try to adapt and get some opportunities on the way. But yes, so it just needs to be creative. Yeah. And it's fun. Yeah. And it's fun. I mean, yes, honestly, when you have yeah, the outrageous label, you know, the disclaimers, everything can be wrong, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> but Baz, do you think we, we've been outrageous enough? Or no, or no, no. I, th I think I will give you one uh, takeaway. What I saw yesterday, I believe that, you know, guys, you are in the matrix. Everything you're getting played for. And people say that's strong. Elon Musk also said it. He said, guys, it's so strange what's happening. Uh, you know, we exist 200 years, they say, they tell us. Uh, but everything happened the last couple of hundred years. And then every time somebody pops up, like Elon Musk or in Lincoln in the US, so I think somebody is there playing us with puppets. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it could be an alien or whatever, you know, I don't know. But uh, I'm getting more expert because the world is really getting sometimes crazy. You see, there is war again, and you know, so uh, even what happens in the States, I think somebody is just playing a game with us. Yeah. So we are not really here. I'm not here. <laughs> It's all for it. I'm not here. Fritz, are you a hologram? Are you really there? No, I'm not. Are, are you an alien lizard? <laughs> I'm here in the flesh. Um, I don't know how, what you can predict about the future, but one thing is pretty certain is some hard truths. And one of the hard truths is going to be 30% of business travel will never come back. Full stop. Yeah. So it's going to be a different world of different products. And, you know, like, of course, new work, human companies being like now virtual and being at home based and people get together at meetings. But I think we had this amazing buzz between, say, 2.13 to 2.17, where we're in the parties of pictures with Pedro. 
at Chayata Party in Berlin, which are absolutely fa fabulous, and we had a really good blast, but it was too much, it was overdrawn, and we all stopped, and we really thought what travel could be, and maybe that's not a bad thing to say, well, let's put a bit more of the quality into travel again and just hire more, 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 more. Yeah. Great, well, look, time has just beaten us, and um, that's it, I'm afraid. I mean, I think it's often said that it's a mugs game making predictions, so please welcome our, thank our four mugs. <laughs> thank you to Mario. Thank you to Elodie. Thanks. Thanks to Baz. Thanks. Thanks to Fritz.